that we're uh, all good to go. Um, and we know that Dorothy was having a little bit of a video issue, so she's popping out and popping back in. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with a very good morning to everyone and greetings if you're watching this later at any particular time of day. Uh, I'm Paul Snyder, Vice President of Healthcare with Right to Market. Thanks for joining us and thanks to Georgia Bio for all of their hard work making the 2020 Innovation Summit possible and for allowing us to contribute. Patients really need to be heard by innovators during the med tech and drug development process. A 2019 study found that only 47% of patients felt pharmaceutical companies understood the emotional, financial, and other needs related to their condition. Add to that near impossibility of face-to-face -face meetings in the foreseeable future, and that makes virtual patient engagement critical. We're going to discuss best practices in overtime virtual engagement, centering on participant uh, selection and participation, blind and double-blind sessions, questions and content, and confidentiality. We'll also discuss the technical functionality sweet spots for patient engagement and the clinical utility that enables tech companies and human expertise to combine and deliver improved outcomes. Joining us are Dorothy Leon Glasser, at least she will be, uh, Executive Director of Advocates for Responsible Care, Jessica Cerullo Merrill, Merrill, sorry, Vice President of Client Services for Vaz Advisors, and Lance Hill, CEO of Within Three. Um, Jessica, let's start with you. Give us just the 30 second bio, if you would. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Paul. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning or if you're watching later at any point. So my name is Jessica Cerule Merrill. I'm Vice President at Vaz Advisors and we are a consulting firm that really works to support pharmaceutical and biotech companies in building mutually beneficial partnerships with advocates, patients, care partners, and other stakeholders to ensure that medicines that are developed truly integrate that patient and care partner perspective and needs. So we do that through a, a myriad of um, activities and opportunities from strategic planning all the way to patient engagement um, workshops and opportunities, which we'll be discussing today. Thanks. And I'm just going to move left to right across uh, my the windows that I see. Lance, give us your 30 seconds. Hi, I'm Lance Hill. I'm the founder of Within3. Um, so what Within3 does, you know, we, we believe that one of the biggest barriers in healthcare is communication. Um, and that there's so many barriers, whether they're regulatory or privacy or just inertia, um, and that if communication works better in healthcare, the outcomes will be better for everyone. And so what we do as a company is, is we build technology-based solutions to improve communication of bringing new therapeutics to market and, and be more inclusive in the stakeholders that are involved in that process. Thanks. And Dorothy, it's good to see you again. Hi! Uh, <laughs> tell, us, tell us a bit about you and uh, Advocates for Responsible Care. Dorothy Leone Glasser. I'm a registered specialist nurse um, and I am the executive director of the Advocates for Responsible Care. And we actually empower advocates to have a voice in their health care treatments and decisions. And uh, we're very active in changing policy and passing legislation under the Georgia Dome. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll do our best to watch for questions in the chat, but if we don't get to yours, we welcome you to connect with us through the conference engage function, or you can email me. I'm happy to take them at paul at right, W-R-I-T-E, the number two, market, M-A-R-K-E-T dot com. I'll add that to the chat when uh, my brain capability <laughs> uh, permits. So let's dive in. And because this is about the patients, Dorothy, we're going to start with you. From a patient's perspective, where do life science companies miss the mark on engagement for new therapies or technologies? Well, you know, until recently, the um, health sciences haven't truly engaged patients, not enough on our end. And we're really excited about starting to collaborate more and to become more involved with the industry itself. I think one of the hardest things, and, and yesterday um, our bio director said, you can't walk in patients' shoes. And I think that statement is so true. I think it's, it's very hard to understand the challenges and hurdles of daily living for people who have chronic illnesses. So taking that into consideration, and that's where we hope that we're going to play a role as advocates, 
to be able to help you see what works more for patients and what doesn't. So communicating with patients is very important and we need to be sure that we make the issue as simple as possible so they understand what our goals are. And we also need to um, be sure that we have some integral networking going on between all the groups. We work with uh, 41 different groups from medical associations to grassroots and faith community leaders. So we really want to be able to have that synergy between all the groups together and then focusing, highlighting on our star advocates. Those are the stories of the patients. And I think that one- Follow up with you, Dorothy. How do patients perceive their needs, uh, especially in the current environment where in-person interactions are so highly limited? Right. Um, we need to be able to work better on connectivity. So what we find is that there's um, there might be access to internet, but then there isn't devices for the patients to be able to use the internet. We're working now with communities in Clayton County where that, that's an issue. Um, then we need to be able to then help them, instruct them about how to use this new technology. This is new for them. Maybe they're used to like a portal to be able to get medications or talk to their physicians, but they're certainly not used to meetings like this where we can all come together. So we're gonna be trying this out for our first capital day in January. And we're gonna see how that goes because we usually have 60 to 100 people there at that uh, event. So we, we're really focusing in on how do we get the word to the patient and then how do we motivate them to be more engaged? And, and this is the area where all of you come in to help us with that. Thank you for that, Dorothy. Jessica, from a business standpoint, what are the top ways life science companies struggle with patient engagement? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Paul. And, um, and just want to echo some really important points that Dorothy brought up around access to technologies. We've been hearing that over the past, you know, eight, nine months that we've been in this pandemic, that while reach the ability to engage virtually has allowed companies to reach additional patient populations. There are still individuals who do not have access to high speed internet or the actual you know, hardware to engage in this manner. And it's such an important point. Um, but back to the, the business challenges, I would say that even before um, we were all forced into the virtual setting, I think that some of the challenges really center around link connecting with the right patients at the right time so that their insights are informing actual decisions um, within the company. So it's very important to not just engage patients in a perfunctory manner, but to truly be able to do it within the timeline so that their insights as appropriate can impact some of the decisions happening. So I think timelines are a big issue. While we all understand that drug development, you know, takes you know many many years, there's so many decision points within it that happen so quickly. So to align the activities um, with the timelines, you know, is a challenge. Um, and then some of the compliance concerns really around um, contracting can also be a bit of a challenge. And it's you know important to develop a to do some internal education within the company to understand the value of bringing the care uh, patient and care partner perspective in to really support a kind of a culture change so that they understand that that engagement is just as important as KOLs or other stakeholders. It's just a different perspective. Lance, what are the ways, I mean, Zoom is, Zoom is obviously a critical function as we're all learning. What are the different ways virtual engagements happen with patients in life science companies? It's not just this, it's not just email. What about the, what are the different ways the engagements work? Sure, yeah, there are really a couple of different ways to think about it. So we, we kind of break the world of virtual engagement into real time or same time virtual engagement like we're doing right now, which means that you know everyone has to be it's Thursday morning, everyone has to be at the same place at the same time, everyone needs to be speaking the same language, everyone needs to have the same sort of technology enablement that, that we were just talking about in terms of internet and devices and familiarity. Everyone needs to be comfortable, especially when you're talking with patient uh, populations, um, depending on what the conversation is about, everyone needs to be comfortable interacting in that, in that uh, forum. Um, 
And so that's a real time sort of engagement. And so virtually all companies today use, you know, whether it's Zoom or WebEx or whatever the technology is. Um, and they're, everyone's, all companies are kind of getting better at how to set up these meetings, how to make them more comfortable, how to make them more interactive. So that's kind of on, on the one hand. Um, and I think people default to these sorts of real-time meetings at first because it's most analogous to being around a table, being in person, it's kind of the most natural sort of way to think about it. The other side of virtual engagement, uh, which is just really expanding like wildfire, uh, if you will, throughout, throughout the industry is, is what we call overtime virtual engagement. So this is where instead of having a one hour call like we're having right now, instead you open up like a, think of it like a private like Facebook room sort of environment or private like online university sort of environment that might be open over, let's say a week or two. Um, and so if you're a patient in that sort of environment, you can log in in the morning. You can log in when you're feeling up to it, frankly. Um, you can log in um, with uh, low internet speed. All you need is a browser and you can basically interact either chat or voice um, and, and you know, voice to text and interact with other patients, interact with the life science companies. Um, because you have that sort of one, one week or two week window while the meeting, if you will, is going on, while the engagement is going on, it also allows everyone to be a lot more thoughtful Maybe look at materials. Um, here's an education piece about this new therapy. Does this even make sense to you? Um, you know, does this really capture what you feel that, that the main points are? Things like that are really easy to do in these overtime sorts of, of, of meetings. So what we see is life science companies really, especially in, in today's world where virtual is really the only way to go, really mixing and matching both. So you're using these real time web, web sort of meetings where that makes sense and usually in direct combinations, sometimes even within the same meeting, maybe you kick off the meeting with a meeting with a, with a Zoom call like this, everyone can see each other, say hello, but then you allow over the next week or two people to log into an overtime system and interact at their leisure um, um, in, in that way. So that, that, those are really the two sets of, of technologies that are being wide, widely used. Um, but on the real the overtime piece, I guess finishing up there, one of the advantages of that is it eliminates not all, but almost all the logistical barriers that you can think about with doing a meeting like this. You don't need high-speed internet. You don't need a, a microphone. You don't need a headset. You don't need to clear your calendar at 6 p.m. at night when the meeting is, or maybe that's when you have you know, dinner with, with your kids, or maybe that's, again, you have a chronic condition, and there's some times of the day where you're just not mentally uh, or emotionally really able to participate in the way you want to. It eliminates all of those. And so from a patient point of view, it really levels the playing field a lot more, which is why on the patient side, we see companies really steering towards these more asynchronous or overtime sorts of technologies. So stay there with us and, and, and describe some of the most critical elements. Um, we, I heard you mentioned some certain functions that are there, but when it comes to sharing or when it comes to privacy or when it comes to material dissemination or conversation between uh, either the patient population themselves or the patients and the life sciences company, what are the, what are the most important elements in that kind of overtime arena uh, from functionality standpoint? Sure, I mean, the, the first one um, is accessibility. Um, again, you're dealing with, you know, we do a lot of work on the physician side and you're dealing with kind of a, a standard level of education, a standard kind of socioeconomic background. That's just not the case with patients. And so if the technology that you're using is hard to use, hard to figure out, hard to log into, can't find where my password is, um, it, it, those sorts of issues are real barriers. So, you, so the first thing is having a technology that is so easy to log into and move around in. And the technology tells you kind of what you're supposed to do next. You're not clicking around tabs, trying to figure out what's going on. That's a huge, huge one. So it's very, very simple, kind of like in the way that Google takes a lot of things and pushes them through this really simple search bar. The technology has to be very, very accessible, very, very easy. The second one that you mentioned is, is privacy, which is critically important. Um, with, uh, with technologies like, like Zoom too, but, but certainly with the overtime, you can do things like blinded or double blinded, or you can maybe have a meeting where there's some part of the, of the discussion that everyone can see, but then maybe you're asking some more personal questions about, um, you know, uh, how people felt during diagnosis or something that maybe they're not as comfortable with. 
Um, you can have kind of private sections or private breakouts. Um, you can mix and match those things. And all the information is very highly secure as well. Some people feel, depending if you're an introvert or an extrovert, you can feel kind of intimidated being in a meeting like this with 10 other people and trying to, to get a word in, you know, and, and, and that, kind of, that's, that dynamic can be difficult for people who aren't used to that sort of um, environment in their life. Um, having the technology really shield them from needing to do that where I can kind of sit and, and type or think can be important. So privacy is, is really, really critical. And then I guess the last thing, and I'll, and I'll build on what Jessica said, um, is, is what you're talking about useful and interesting? Um, patients, anyone really, but patients certainly interacting with life sciences company, they're not doing it just because they have nothing better to do that day, right? They're doing it because they're hoping to affect some sort of change. They're hoping that what they have to say influences a better clinical study design that makes it easier for them to participate in a clinical trial and not, not have to you know, drive to the clinic every other week to, to do something that they could have done at, with a home nurse instead. Um, it makes it may be that the, uh, the way that they have to kind of understand how to manage their, their condition and, and how they think about that becomes easier. Maybe the way that, that people are able to kind of self-diagnose gets easier. They want that information to go in, into the actual life science company strategy. And if, if that's divorced, so you're having this patient meeting on November 27th, because that's the only time people were available, but you need to make those decisions on November 6th. That's, that's really a wasted opportunity. Um, and so the, having the technologies available when you need them, as you need them very flexibly helps with what Jessica was talking about. Yeah, and that, uh, I think that's a great segue. Uh, you talked about you know, improvements in clinical trial design by enlisting uh, patient input in ways that work for them. Um, generally, Dorothy, I wanna start with you here in general. How do you define success in patient engagement programs? They don't have to be of one particular type or another, but what do the most successful patient engagement programs look like to you? I think they have to be easily understandable as Lance mentioned, um, because that'll motivate the patient to want to be more involved. You have to tell them why this is important for them um, I also think that we need to address language and cultural incompetency in when we're doing presentations or disseminating information to patients. So you have to be able to reach them on their level. And uh, we take great pride in that. Um, everything from language opportunities, clicking a button on the site that can turn it into their language. Um, the other thing that's really important that makes it successful is patients are already overwhelmed by managing their illness. If you could partner them with a family member, usually a younger member who is used to using technology, um, that's a great asset for them because they know then there's somebody there for support. It's going to make them want to use it more. So I think that those areas are critical for patient engagement. Yes. And Jessica, let's follow up with you. How do you define success in patient engagement? And if it can be, you can be general if you like, or if you'd like to be more specific in, in changes that over time ability uh, have made in your work or your client's work. Yes, no, I mean, I think going back to one of the points I made before, just about engaging the right patients, you know, at the right time when their input can really have an impact. Um, is essential, but then the second part of defining success from our perspective is that you really want to create a space where a robust two-way dialogue happens. It's so important to um, offer patients the opportunity to truly challenge the teams, and you need both stakeholders in the room so that they can learn from each other, um, and so that it feels like a meaningful opportunity, and you're building trust and partnership with that community, and not just checking a box. Um, so I think really that meaningful two-way dialogue and creating that space for it is so important and whether that was in person before which going back to the right patient you know, you didn't always have the opportunity to have that diversity and representation because certain people have demands on their life that don't allow them to travel to now where we're doing a lot over in the virtual setting which has opened up our reach um, but you still want to create that open space um, to allow for that 
Lance, we'll stay with you with the same, uh, go to you with the same question. How do you define success in overtime or asynchronous patient engagement programs? I, I, I would, from our point of view, I guess my point of view, come maybe build on uh, what Dorothy and Jessica said and come to the word engagement. So if, if, you have, if you have a meeting like this and you have 10 patients on the call and three talk and seven say nothing, yeah. that's, so you've checked the box, you've, you've gotten patient input, quote unquote, and maybe those three said some really amazing things during the course of the conversation, but you haven't really gotten to the sense of the other seven, what they might've had to share and, and maybe why they didn't share it. Um, and that's a real missed opportunity. So it's not the loudest voice that you want at the table, you kind of want the, the combination of all the voices. Um, and I think so when you're designing your virtual engagement or whatever, you really need to think through, is my goal that, yes, I have patience, but really it's Dorothy I really wanna hear from because she, she you know, heads the advocacy group, or am I designing something that really is meant to be kind of a robust round table? And then how am I approaching my questions, my content to make sure that, that that's happening? Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that these days um, with, with these technologies that are becoming increasingly easy, but it's not sufficient just to kind of throw up a, you know, a, a meeting and hope it goes well is really not, not a, a great way to try to get the outcome you're looking for. The other thing that I'll say too is I think um, life science companies sometimes it's a little, you can imagine it's intimidating from the patient's point of view, but it's also intimidating from the life science company's point of view. So I'm working on this, this therapy for years, perhaps, and now I'm going to have this meeting with these patients, some of which are advocates that are really important, and it's, I don't want it to go bad, and it's nervous, and it's, it's nerve-wracking. I'm trying to produce it and make sure it's perfect. It, it, can, it can be a little bit challenging on that side, which can make them feel sometimes stuffy and stilted. Um, and I think that if you remember, you kind of replace the word patient with people, you're having a meeting with people. The people happen to have the, whatever the illness is that, that, you're, that you're discussing, but they're people. And if you design a program that is good for people, it will work out so much better than if you say there's a patient thing that is kind of us versus them. Thanks so much for that. And while I was thinking about it, there's a, there is a question in the chat. Um, the question is, are patients able to participate as fully in the overtime activities? Um, is there a way for them to comment or talk to one another? I, I think I know the answer to this, but Lance, I'll start, start with you there. Yeah, the, the answer is, is yes. <clears throat> when we do patient, uh, patient overtime meetings, we get more than 90% participation, more than 90% of the meetings that we do. So that, and participation isn't just someone logged in, it's that someone logged in and, and commented, uh, looked at materials, um, you know, watched, uh, watched videos and had thoughts or reactions. So these overtime tools are really discussion engines. They're built to allow private and really foster a lot of back and forth robust discussion, whether it's talking back and forth, whether it's kind of a survey plus discussion, whether it's on, on reviewing documents and commenting right, right on documents about, I like this, this doesn't make sense to me um, in all sorts of ways. So that's what those, those programs are built for, uh, these technologies. Thanks for that. Jessica, let's talk a little wider. Um, where are the top opportunities or functions for patient engagement to the left and to the right of clinical trials? We talked about clinical trial design. We know that there is functionality required during the clinical trial, but from a life cycle, a larger to the left and the right of the clinical trial, where are the top opportunities for patient engagement and the technologies that support them? So I would say there are many, as we all just talked about, patients are people, but they're experiencing the disease or condition that they're living with across, you know, the entire journey. And so I think when you're looking to the left earlier in development, some, some key opportunities are really, first and foremost, you know, um, your hypothesis or what you believe this medicine will do for a, a patient you know, is that of value to them? Is it, is it worth going down the path of, of clinical trials and of that long journey of research? Is it really something at the other end that they want a treatment for? I think that's first and foremost. And um, a point that Lance made earlier about this kind of, you know, patients and then the, the researchers and, and kind of that wall, I, I think that sometimes, and I talk about this a lot, but the research teams, you know, they have invested their whole careers in these ideas. 
and they see them as you know life-changing and remarkable and that's true and important but what can also be true at the same time is that you know patients are people living their lives with many different challenges that they're encountering just like all of us work childcare, you know, um, family demands and they may have a different perception of that and that's okay and we should hear that um, so I think very early in development, just sense checking, you know, the direction that you're taking a program in can be really important. Um, when we're thinking about the other end of it, you know, understanding um, barriers to diagnosis, you know, what is um, the HCP perspective can be very different on that, especially in rare diseases. And so understanding, you know, what are those barriers in the real world setting? What do patients and care partners encounter when they're trying to obtain a diagnosis? Um, access barriers and those change over time. So even when you have a marketed product for many years, the environment will change, the environment the patients are living in. Um, and so reconnecting with those communities is really important. We've done some very successful longitudinal patient engagement panels where we have the, the same group of patients and we, we contract them in a manner where we can go to them you know, as a need arises, which goes back to my earlier point of timelines, you can actually, they're all ready and waiting um, and you can go to them and you can open up these platforms and put the questions to the individuals and, and let them, you know, when they have the time, when they're comfortable, um, go in and, and offer their insights. And what that also really supports is time zones. You know, it's hard. I think Lance, you made the point getting all of us here at this time, it's, you know, East Coast time, that's great. Um, but what about, you know, other, other voices and other time zones that you can't gather and these long-term engagements over these virtual platforms really allow for the greatest reach, which um, can have a, an excellent impact on your program. Yeah. Lance, tell us about, uh, this was, was going to be for Dorothy, hopefully she can pop back shortly, uh, but I think, um, give us an example of a particularly successful engagement program uh, that blends multiple touch points and uh, yeah, as specific as you can, remember we're, we're speaking with or uh, life science and biopharma developers that are that would probably like to improve theirs. Can you give us an example of one that was successful beyond expectations? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a couple so, and, and kind of different parts of the life cycle like Jessica was talking about. So I'll start off with, with, a, with a clinical example. So we have, um, a client of ours who is was working on designing a clinical trial for a rare disease or a really um, you know, horrific disease that affects children, newborns. Um, and they, as you can imagine, they're trying to try a new therapy out, but they need to get um, patients to enroll in the trial at a point where they're finding out their newborn has this, this very serious illness. It's very, very difficult. Um, and so what they did is they had, um, they kind of set up two side-by-side -side, um, virtual engagements in, in two rooms, if you will. In one room, they had a set of patients who had already participated in a previous study for the same disease and talked to them about what, when you when you found out, you know, how easy was it to get, you know, for, to even enroll in the trial, to stay going in the trial, not drop out as you're in, you know, the worst emotional time of your, of your entire life, not drop out or continue, what would have made it better um, would it be better for, for, for us to be having, you know, paying for hot, for hotel rooms right next, you know, within the hospital, would that have been easier for you or not to, to help you kind of stay, stay attached, things of that nature. And then, and then simultaneously in another room, they had a set of, of, um, folks who had never participated in a clinical study before and asking them kind of their same opinions. And what they were really trying to solve is how can we get patients enrolled in our study and how can we design the study? not in terms of the medical endpoints and, and does the drug do what it's supposed to do, but can we design it in such a way that patients stay in it so the data is actually good and it's high quality. Um, those two things, those two sessions simultaneously led to material changes in how they were going to actually execute the trial, which ultimately led to uh, a better outcome. On, on, the, on the flip side, I remember we did, we did um, a program that was a mix of meeting, it was actually a Zoom, set of meetings like this. Um, it was on the commercial side. So it was with a chronic disease. And you, you see these commercials, at least in the US on TV, you know, these kind of smiley, happy people walking down the beach with their dog while the, all the warning labels are flashing in, in the bottom. And so they had a number of, of those concepts for this chronic disease. And they had actual patients with the disease 
And what they would do is they would kind of play them like watching like a YouTube trailer. And they would say, here's our idea for this sort of kind of, you know, communication. And then they would flip over to an online environment and say, okay, so everyone kind of stopped. We have a series of questions for each, you know, take five to 10 minutes and just really kind of answer these sets of questions. And then they'd come back together and talk about them. And that led to really amazing interaction about the perception of people with the disease and what they go through versus what's featured in these kind of shiny, happy TV commercials that really allowed the company to do something much more real and impactful uh, with their messaging than kind of the standard, you know, take our drug and smiles happen on your face and everything's wonderful sort of TV commercial. Dorothy, nice to see you back. Um, I'm gonna, <laughs> that was, I actually was gonna leave that question with you. Tell us about a particularly successful patient engagement program, a specific story if you can, especially one that blends many, many types of touch points. I think um, the most successful stories are the ones where the patient talks about just what Lance was saying that I caught the tail end of, um, what it's like for them on a daily basis. So if you give patients the opportunity for their voice to be heard, they're going to be much more willing to um, come together and to share with you what they normally might be reticent to do because they don't know you, they don't trust you. And I think that um, usually for us, it's going through the advocates and getting to larger patients that already establishes that trust. So if they trust me or they trust the advocates, they're gonna be more willing to engage with others. So one of the pieces that, um, that we use is actually videotaping their stories and being able to use that, whether it be with legislators on this cut type of format, whether it be um, with press and media and on our social media platforms. It's very important that we highlight the patient and it, having advances in and innovation in drugs and treatments doesn't mean anything if it doesn't get to benefit the patient and they don't see what that benefit is. And we're facing that right now with the COVID development. So for me, it's very important that just get rid of all the myths that people have about the life sciences and what this means and bring it back to the daily life and the outcomes uh, for the patients and doing it in num larger numbers works better. And then, you know, from before what we're saying that we think is really important when you have a successful program is that you have a follow-up. Everybody like Jessica was talking about just likes to check the list. Well, I did that. That's what upsets patients the most mm -hmm. is if you really want to show that you care and that you're putting their life first and what they need first, you're gonna follow up with that. Whether it's through the chat session, whether it's through scheduling a time with them one-on-one, -on -one. Um, what I think works right now is doing it in smaller groups. And uh, the other thing is that we do this sometimes when we were talking about um, availability for patients of technology, is that uh, we use sometimes faith-based community centers and we get groups together, even during COVID, be careful, but we get groups together and we share in that setting so that there's support there for them. One thing that patients always need is that they need to understand that their voice is heard and somebody really cares and they need to know that there's a follow-up support because that's the thing that you wanna to do to keep them engaged. So I think a successful program keeps patients engaged that you start with and allows them to bring more patients to the table so that it expands. I think that's a great point, Dorothy, uh, the, the follow-up and, and lifetime and bringing more in and becoming trusted. Um, Jessica, I love the stories. So tell, tell us a story of, a, of an engagement program that you found inspiring that, that delivered an outcome. Mm -hmm. 
So thank you. Um, I would say that to build off of Lance and Dorothy's points at the very, at the outset, we we did a program where we gathered um, patient advisors across the globe, across disease areas of interest to the company, um, and then we really being able to do it virtually um, allowed us to really make sure that there was representation related to ethnicity, age, gender, health literacy, um, education backgrounds, where people are accessing care. So is it in a more rural setting? Are you closer to a cent um, an academic center or center of excellence? Getting the full spectrum of perspectives. And what we did at the beginning of that initiative is we came to, we, once we um, you know had all their commitment, we said, here's a loose vision of what we would like to do with you over the next year. Does that meet your expectations? When you signed up for this, why did you choose to give us your time? What's your expectation of this initiative? And how do we plan something that over the next 12 months will meet everyone's needs? And so we really co-created the, the framework for the longitudinal patient panel with the patients who we were consulting. And so we set that up and then periodically I would say maybe every other month, we came to those individuals with a key question from um, a research and development team you know, at the company, and we would open a session, we would provide them with the resources, we would, and they engaged each other in that two-way dialogue, and they even challenged each other on some of the perspectives that they were adding, and then we would follow that up with a live call where we could dig in deeper and really engage in, in a dialogue to understand their perspectives. And um, you know, one of the more successful um, engagements was really around the burden of sampling. And so oftentimes what we hear in our work from researchers is, you know, well, that's the way the protocol has been developed in the past and, and it works. And so, you know, we just pulled that sample, that template, and we updated it for this study. And what the patients and care partners will do is really challenge the team, you know, is that test needed? Is that biopsy really needed? What are you going to do with that information? Um, because for them, as you know, that's all, that might be a really long drive to a hospital. That's a day from work. That's yeah. childcare. And so hearing that exchange where then the researcher sits and says, wow, what information will I get from that, that sample, that test? Do I need it? Does it really enhance the study? And then coming out and actually reworking those protocols. And then in the long term, you're avoiding amendments you will probably have better recruitment, better retention, and um, and allows you at the end to really have a real more robust, you know, data to, to go to the regulators, um, you know, if that's the opportunity you have based on the science. We've got a, another question, um, and this is for you, Dorothy. Um, do you think media highlighting trial outcomes helps patient engagement, or is it more important to highlight stories of individual patients? I think it's a combination of both. And if the media is going to highlight what's happening in trials, and hopefully we're saying good outcomes of trials, um, I think it's important why patient advocacy has to be engaged with life sciences so that we come behind that and we say why it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where then we interject the story. Agreed. We have the patient story that goes with that. Yeah. That develops transparency for the patient, trust for the patient, and compliance, which Jessica was really talking about. So what we're talking about here today is really starting a life sciences approach that's patient-centered. And I'm older than I look. I've been doing this a very long time. And this is the first time that I can honestly say that we're on that right track, that it really puts the patients first. And we need this right now, not only in the area of diversity and equity, which is even more important than diversity. Realize always that all the patients are not starting at the same start line. Some patients are way ahead because they're more comfortable and more used to doing this and others are way behind. Mm -hmm. And that's what equity is about. That Equity is about not only that everyone finishes at the same point, but that you take into consideration everyone's not starting at the same point. 
So we are big fans of press and media. We do press releases all the time with everything that we're involved with because we want the community to know patient advocates think this is a good thing. And here's why. And that posters up our involvement and engagement. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's never the one thing, you know, it's working together, making the most of the opportunities. And if there is a story that really resonates that is tied to some outcome or result, I mean, that's something that stings. Um, Lance, we, the title of this, uh, you know, was best practices in overtime. So uh, in the eight or so minutes we have left, and we're not going to get to everything that, that we had planned, I'm sure, but let's deliver on that. Um, what are the best practices? We've talked about some of the elements. We've talked about some impacts. What do you need to do to ensure you're making the most out of, uh, you know, whether it's one week, whether it's two weeks, whether it's longer than that, what are the best practices for overtime asynchronous engagement? Yeah, I think the, the first thing for, for again, so the asynchronous is a meeting that maybe, <clears throat> like Jessica was saying in her example, where a session is open for a couple of weeks and people can kind of come and go as they, as they please and engage over that time frame. Um, you know, one of the best practices is really you have to change your thinking a little bit. So I mentioned before that traditionally what happens is people are used to a live meeting and, you know, around a table or something like that or in, or in, a, in an auditorium or something. Um, and so when they go virtual, they try to replicate the live meeting almost like one for one. Um, and you don't need to do that with virtual because what you do when you do that is you inherit all the limitations of a live meeting. Mm-hmm. When I have to be there, what the agenda is, how much time we have to spend on this, that, the other thing, what we do with the parking lot material items that we never get to talk about, um, you know, all, you know, the, all those issues. And so instead, if you look at a, a virtual environment as you can, you can string together a series of touch points um, and have it be really seamless. And so instead of saying there's 50 things I want to cover, how about instead you do, you know, four meetings with, with 15, 15 things at a time and you, and you spread those out over, over, over four weeks. And by the way, you're not asking people to commit to two hours every Friday for the next four weeks. You're doing it in a way where, yeah, over the course of the next week, when you're available, you know, come in and interact with these things. And so you can be a lot more flexible with your thinking and how you design these sorts of engagements. Um, they're also not as expensive, at least they shouldn't be. If you're working with the right partners, they should not be expensive. And so if you think about that, I have this platform, it's always on, Jessica's point exactly, it's always available. I can be thinking about a longer term dialogue with these stakeholders or these patients, as opposed to like, I, I'm, I'm putting all my chips into this big meeting on this day and it's really expensive and I really hope it goes well and it's, and it's that sort of men- mentality. So thinking about spreading out your in- interaction over time because the cost to convene your, your patients gets really close to zero when you get when you get virtual, especially as compared to, you know, going going to some sort of live, live event. Yeah. Um, that, that's a big one. I guess the, the other thing is um, you have to make sure that you're talking, um, which sounds really weird, but a lot of times what we see in, in virtual engagements is there's the life science company maybe presents something and then they want to listen, but there's not a lot of talking. There's not a lot of actual engagement and back and forth. And, and why do you say that? What does that mean? And and that's you know it's 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 a it's the presentation and then a listening session. If that makes sense, um, I think the ability to actually have two way dialogue to to go to go back and forth to really dig in. Why did you say that? That's really interesting. I wouldn't have expected that. Do you all feel the same way? That sort of facilitation of the of a dialogue online is really really important because it is easy online to kind of just you know sit back and, and hope that, that people say things. And people may fill the airwaves, but it's but people leaving won't get what you're looking for. And the last thing I think is building exactly what Dorothy said. You know, we do, we do a lot of surveys when we do patient engagements on our platform. And uh, one of the biggest complaints is that I spent the hour, let's say, interacting with you and I gave you all my ideas and I got a thank you letter and that's it. 
Mm -hmm. I have no idea if anything I said helped you, mm -hmm. if it changed anything, did it matter? And the whole reason I did it was to try to make a difference. And I have no feeling that I did. That makes me not really feel good about engaging with you the next time. Mm -hmm. And so I think a very simple best tip, regardless of what type of virtual meeting you're doing, is after you kind of consumed whatever the discussion was, reach back out to these folks and say, you know, thank you. We designed our trial differently because of what you all said, or thank you. We're going to do this differently. or We're thinking about that. or We're going to have another meeting now based on what you said uh -huh. or something. So that ability to, to, to close the loop is so simple, but so important. Mm -hmm. That's outstanding. Thanks. Um, we're, uh, I'm acknowledging that we're three minutes out. Um, and so I'm moving, I'm moving farther down the list. Just beware, uh, friends. Um, Dorothy, how has COVID changed patient engagement to date and through the next 12 months or so? How has it changed your work? How has it changed how you see patients uh, interacting with industry? I, I think there's pros and cons, obviously. I think um, one of the cons is the technology itself, making sure that people have access, affordability, um, and mentorship on how to use it. Um, I think um, the other piece that is positive for us is people who are seriously ill, doing these types of programs is fabulous for them because just the mobility issues alone for most patients is daunting. Um, and you hear that in clinical trials, it's daunting to get there. Um, so this is a great asset, you're in their home and to go back on what Lance and Jessica have been talking about, it's a conversation and it's in a conversation that you find out the real needs of the patients and Thanks. the people that you're talking to. So I think that that's really been critical um, for us to realize the pros and the cons of this and to form an alliance that fosters this and continues this and expands this mm -hmm. for all patient communities. Thank you for that. Jessica, in the last minute we have, we're gonna wrap with you. What it, Tell us about anything that's changed in your processes or capabilities in the past nine to 12 months and what you see for the next 12. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I would say that um, you, clearly we've all gone fully virtual. And I think that as the other speakers have noted, you know, that's created opportunities and also um, some barriers. And so, you know, we've really been thinking about, and Lance made this point, you, you don't want to replicate an in-person advisory board online. That's, that's not going to get you what you need. And so we have really pivoted to embracing these over time virtual platforms to allow for that two-way dialogue, which is so important. And also um, in working with you know, the patient and care partner communities that we work to link with our clients, um, it's been, they want to talk more. People are more isolated. They have more challenges now than they had before. And so it's really creating those spaces so we can fully engage and hear um, individuals and then link that to the business objectives of our clients so that we are creating meaningful change that benefits the community and the life science companies. And so that's what we've been working to pivot to do. And um, just with my last minute, I was speaking with an advocate last week who also just mentioned, even in the virtual setting, thinking about low and high tech. So there, there's, there's gradations within virtual and how do we meet patients where they are and allow them to be engaged through both the high and the low tech. Y'all, time flies. This was a great, great engagement. I, I enjoyed spending time with you. Um, it's time to wrap up. We didn't touch on every aspect of this topic. That would be its own conference in its entirety. Um, if you have additional questions, we encourage you to uh, connect with us through the engagement opportunity, our, our names and bios, and there's a contact opportunity in the uh, conference platform. My email is in the chat and thanks so much, Jessica. Thanks so much, Lance. Thanks so much, Dorothy. Thanks so much to Georgia Bio and those who attended. Uh, I'm gonna do everything I can to share this if, if and when it becomes available so uh, that we can, we can share it beyond just ourselves. So 
y'all enjoy. Thank you so much for joining us and everybody take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Paul. Bye. You're Bye. welcome. Bye.